The Legend series has taught to great champions and great racers. All of them have passion and self-belief, but none have excited the sport or divided the sport quite like Ayrton Senna. Exhibitions like this one to commemorate the 20th anniversary of his death at Imola help us to examine whether he was a kind of reckless renegade or perhaps the greatest of all time. But one thing is certain, Ayrton Senna was an outstanding legend of Formula One. He got the best out of everybody, that's what he was good at. And on the tra track in a racing car, he was extraordinarily special. Ayrton was special because uh, Ayrton, Ayrton was above of everyone. Ron Emerson said to me, you keep watching this guy, he's going to become one of the greatest in the sport. Yeah, he, he, he never said more true words. Well, Senna was... Like no other driver that I have ever met before or since. He is different, and he was different. He had this belief that he had a God-given right to win. Ayrton was always uh, an example for, for, for myself personally. tried to teach me stuff through experience, not only by telling me. And I had a, a good share of time, you know, just uh, enjoying family time, but also some competitive time with him. He was always the one who would go to the limits and sometimes beyond, but uh, not in a way that um, he didn't respect it. He always did respect uh, the, the danger. Ayrton Senna, a Formula One racing career that spanned March 1984 to May the 1st, 1994. 41 race victories with Lotus and with McLaren, three world titles, all of them with McLaren. But everyone who raced against him in this period seemed to have an opinion, especially about his strong sense of self-belief that sometimes went beyond the spirit of the sport. And that self-belief showed itself early on, abandoning a young marriage and a comfortable life back in Brazil to try to establish himself in British single-seater racing. Back then, the ideal route into Formula One. I got on great with him because, you know, 110% focus on the job you're doing and you couldn't get a better guy. He was, um, he would ring me up after a test day. Dickie, I just remember that, you know, that test we did, you know, um, the car was doing this, the car was doing that. And this was three or four days after you'd been running. But when he was younger, he really loved life and he loved his racing, but he didn't really like the politics and all the stuff that went with Formula One. It wasn't him. He was talking about the best times of his racing career was when it was simple, when he went racing with Terry Fullerton in the go-karts. And he called, and he, and he seemed to hark back to a kind of time sort of you know, um, a sort of halcyon time when he was younger, when it was just all so simple, and then it, and that's just, that's unfortunately Formula One, isn't it? It's full of complex uh, things you'd rather have, not have to deal with, um, and you just want to get on with the driving and simply going as fast as you can, but it's not like that. I, I am, like you said, still young, 31, but I've been involved in, in, in motor racing from four years old. Believe me. <laughs> and um, when I come to England in 1981 to participate in the Formula 4 Championship, it was my first season of racing cars. Until then, it was only go-karts. And uh, I've been through several seasons here in different categories, successfully, fortunately. And um, lots of the things that I learned and that I subsequently use in Formula 1 have come from England because here I learned how to race as a professional, I learned how to observe the flags, I learned how to follow the marshals, the starting procedures, the testing procedures, setup of cars, uh, the relationship with the engineers, mechanics, team owners, team managers, and that um, has made a lot of my 
personality in terms of motor racing. I know that um, often I don't get the best press in England, but uh, I suppose nobody's perfect. I try hard, and I try hard to, to be better, to improve. And uh, i just like to say thank you to all of those people here in England that have given me the opportunity from 1981 to come through all the way, and in such a relatively short period of time, get so much success. Thank you. Ayrton Senna dominated the British Formula Ford scene in 1981 and 1982, but it was only by making big financial and personal sacrifices that he was able to extend his career into the 1983 British Formula 3 championship. The season became a classic, as Senna, who should have dominated the campaign, came under increasing pressure from Martin Brundle. There were desperate moments as he tried to fend off Brundle's challenge. He eventually claimed the title at the final round, but he'd made very hard work of it. I had to sit him down a couple of times because he just didn't want to finish second. You know, comfortable points in the bag, but no, he'd have a go at taking for the lead and would have an accident. So I think if he was just so determined to win all the time. The potential was clear. Despite overtures from McLaren and a test with Williams, Senna wanted to keep financial control of his career, so his entry into Formula One in 1984 was further back down the grid. 1984, the Monaco Grand Prix, Ayrton Senna was driving a Tolman, a British car which hadn't got a prayer of winning against the competition that he was against, like Alain Prost in the McLaren. Prost is waving his hand. Prost goes through, waving his hand at the officials. He wants to stop the race, and who can blame him? Now, I'm just waiting for Senna to come through, and the gap as Senna goes through, quite dispassionately, is down to 11 seconds. He's taken four seconds out of Prost's lead. Because he was a great driver in the wet, uh, he clawed his way through the field. We got to the end of the race. Uh, Ayrton Senna was closing up on him. He actually passed him on the finish line. And Cross is stopping. And Senna crosses the line before he gets there. Now, that's amazing. Cross has stopped actually on the line. Senna passed him as he got to the line. It will be... Um really a tragic result for Senna. However, he's not about to be world champion this year. He will undoubtedly be world champion in the future if his career continues. After Tolman came his three seasons with Lotus, and the breakthrough victory, also in rain-soaked conditions, came in the 1985 Portuguese Grand Prix at Estoril, only his second race for the team. The man of the 1985 Portuguese Grand Prix is and has been all through practice and all through the race, this man, Ayrton Senna, in the JPS Team Lotus, out goes the chequered flag, and Senna has won. Look at him, both hands waving with joy. Well, I'm very happy to be the one that uh, managed to prove that the Lotus car is not only quick in qualifying conditions, but even on the race conditions, although it was wet. Five more victories followed at Lotus, and in 1988, having proved his pace and his front-running qualities, he moved to join Alain Prost at McLaren, and one of the sport's fiercest rivalries was created. He brought with him the support of engine supplier Honda, and at least at the outset, he seemed to have the surprising support of his teammate as well. We are having a meeting with all Honda people, and they wanted to have Nelson as a driver. And I said, and Nelson was a good friend. He was always close to me. I did not know Ayrton very well I mean, at, the, at the time. But I said, why, why Nelson? If you want to make a strong team, take the best. Take, take the youngest, take the, the one for the future. Take Ayrton. And they all looked at me. I said, why do you want to take Ayrton? I said, for the interest of the team, take, take Ayrton. Ask them if it's not true, you know, it's, Take care 1988, Ayrton Senna joins Alain Prost in the McLaren team, now powered by Honda engines and clearly the strongest team in the sport. One of their drivers was surely going to win the title. But which one and what was the best way to handle and manage the two most ambitious, motivated drivers on the grid? 
Oh, we were excited. For sure, we knew it was going to be fireworks, but uh, we were expecting it, you know, and Rome was expecting it too, because you can manage them for a while, but after a while, it, it, it was, you have a time bomb, you know, ready to go in any time, and, and eventually did. Well, there was nothing more certain as far as I was concerned that it was going to go wrong. The challenge was how, did, how to keep it, um, how to keep it at least sensibly balanced and um, but being very competitive uh, having uh, traits both as a Brazilian uh, and, a, and a Frenchman and uh, nationalistic traits uh, that I'd experienced in the part in, in previous drivers that you know you have to manage you have to take that into account and um, uh, when we had big explosions they were big and uh, required um, a firm hand and um, strangely because you you had both of them in the team the, the, you could push very hard on an individual uh, because of course the consequences would be they wouldn't be in the team and we were the dominant force at the time uh, but occasionally uh, their behavior was equal uh, equally bad and therefore you had you had to deal with both of them and that that required a very different approach what started developing there were little separate cliques and discussions and corners and things. So I put a stop to that and I wanted everything done in front of everybody else. So the engineers running those cars had to be out in the open. I loved working with them both, particularly Ayrton with the strategy because he had some great ideas on finding spots for uh, empty laps for qualifying and stuff. He was very, he was a very deep thinker on the strategic stuff, you know, and um, people always used to say he's fantastic at getting clear laps, but it was really easy. He was just standing on the pit wall with a radio and he was in the car psyching himself up, ready to go and looking for a gap and sending him out at the right time, you know. Prost won in Brazil. Senna took victory at the San Marino Grand Prix, but it was the Monaco Grand Prix, a race that Senna was dominating, that also showed his immaturity as a racer and a character. Ayrton had nearly a minute lead. Senna leading by 40 seconds now, an enormous margin. And then suddenly a line went by Gerhard. Prost is taken, he's done it. Prost has taken Berger. And then start carving lap record after lap record, and that, taking two, three seconds a lap on Senna. And Ron just mad, he keeps shouting, he's not going to catch you, it's impossible, it's impossible, never catch you, slow down, slow down. And Alain kept going quicker, so he kept looking at the port, uh, Alain closer and closer, and, and he lost control. He just uh, got to port here and kicked the inside barrier. That is Senna, sensation, on lap 67, Ayrton Senna goes out of the lead of the Monaco Grand Prix at the Portier. Conveniently, his uh, flat was very close there, so he just walked to his flat and didn't contact us or anything. And I spent all afternoon, the rest of the afternoon, ringing and ringing, and first they didn't answer anybody. Later on, he answered him, and it was um, Isabel, I think was her name, the lady that looked after the flat, and he said, Isabel, Tell him, it's Joe, I want to talk to him. No one else, it's Joe. Uh, no, no, Senor Ayrton is not here. Said, oh, come on, I know he's here. And uh, it's, every time I ring, he said to me the same. Finally, at 9 o'clock, he said, please, Isabel, I know he's there. And uh, then uh, I heard Ayrton, yes, give me the phone. And uh, he, was, he was still crying at that time. He said, I don't know what happened. I must be the most idiot man in the world. He said, uh, the steering wheel came off my hand. When he hit, it didn't come out of his hand, but he said that was the expression that he said when he, he hit so hard on the from that he had to take his hands off. <sighs> it's just it's one of those mistakes that uh, he would, I'm sure, he'd never forgotten and never forgive himself. Senna regrouped and won six of the next nine races. But even when his teammate had the advantage, as in the Portuguese Grand Prix at Estoril, Senna was dangerously reluctant to concede anything and came close to putting his teammate into the pit wall. That was very close. 
they didn't touch, but if they touch, one of them would have gone into the pit lane with all of the teams there, would have been disaster. Ayrton has a small problem. He thinks that he can't, he can't kill himself because he believes in God and things like this, and I think that's very dangerous. <laughs> But the penultimate race in Japan, it was Senna at his best. After a dreadful start, came a brilliant drive through the field from 14th in wet and dry conditions. His eighth victory of the season and his first world title. Senna gets away, Frost, fantastic! Senna left on the grid, and they go flying past him. And this has given Frost an enormous advantage. Ayrton Senna down in 14th place, he has got it all to do. And Ayrton Senna is now starting to carve his way through the field. You're going to see very soon Ger Gerhard Berger losing his third position to Ayrton Senna, who's closing up visually all the time. Senna is getting close to him, and Senna is going to challenge for the lead. Ayrton Senna has got the lead. And once again, we had the situation where Ayrton Senna is prepared to put his courage in both hands, go for it, and dive through. Ayrton Senna crosses the line, and you can see his exultation. Alain Prost crosses the line in second position. Ayrton Senna, the new world champion. It's been a long season, I think, for me and for Alain, and it's been amazing fighting between us. A lot of pressure on both of us, and uh, outdoors we always try to minimize the pressure to make it less painful. It's impossible, and it was very hard, and I, I still cannot believe it's finished. Senna world champion McLaren dominant, but within the team, the tensions and suspicions were growing, fueled by Alain Prost's belief that his teammate was getting preferential treatment, from Honda in particular. We had uh, Mr. Kawamoto, president of Honda, came to Switzerland, and we had a dinner, and uh, I had a very, very strange discussion because I said, you know, I feel that Honda is uh, very uh, going in favor of Ayrton. And he said to me, yes, I know, I know. And uh, we, have a, we have a new generation of, uh, you know, engineers, mechanics, and they like Ayrton, they like the panache of Ayrton, and for sure they are more behind. Psychology of a racing driver is a big, big part of his performance. I, would say, I always said 70, 80 percent. It's very subjective, but it's a big, big part. And as soon as you feel that you have a, a sort of advantage or sort of preference, or you know, I remember very well once I've seen the engines coming, you know, and uh, it was written in the, on, on the engine special for Ayrton, you know, thing like this. What does that mean? Is, is the engine better, or maybe it's exactly the same? Or, I don't know. But you don't want to see that. You, you want to have a, a equal treatment, and uh, inside the team, it, it started to be to be a, a problem. It was only psychology, you know. But for me, I did not uh, feel very well, you know, and I felt a big difference between '89 and '88, mm. and I don't I still do not uh, understand uh, why. They were both pretty calculating, to be honest, and um, I think that uh, Ayrton was always a bit more animated, and therefore came across as a little bit less controlled, whereas Alan was, you know, far more calculating uh, behind the scenes. But they, they both used their national press very effectively. Uh, they, were, you know, they were completely capable of presenting a unified front in, in, in front of the media in Europe or at a Grand Prix and then fuel the national press when they got home, which of course then you know, really provoked uh, reaction from each other uh, uh, when they were on the, either of them were on the receiving end of the consequences. So that was challenging, but they, you know, it's, it, was, it wasn't really that unpleasant. It was just occasionally unpleasant. And uh, you had, in being tough, you, you not only use energy, but you lose a bit of respect. And that's not always a good thing. In 1989, the rivalry became raw and public at the San Marino Grand Prix. Senna and Prost had qualified one and two, and Senna proposed that whoever was first in Tintosa should keep the lead, so not jeopardizing their chances. Prost agreed. But then the race was stopped because of Gerhard Berger's fiery accident at Tamburello. 
and when the restart came, it was Prost away first. But Senna ignored the arrangement and went past through Tosa. According to him, the team orders didn't apply to the restart. They had a clear agreement with Ron Dennis. Who wins the start goes first in the first corner. Everything fine until Prost won the start. And Senna overtook him in the first corner. And Prost was like this and said, what's going on now? We have an agreement. But Senna couldn't do different. He said six times, excuse me, but it was maybe a mistake. But at the end of the day, next time he would do it the same because he's played like this. And I remember Pironi and Villeneuve, the same story yeah, also. So it, in the end of the day with these guys, there is no agreement or things, except this is for their advantage. And Ayrton on this was number one. But with Sisham, he always, you always never had the feeling, you know. In some other times, some other drivers say, well, that's about, you know. But with Ayrton, it was always somehow, with his charm, he always covered everything. But ask Alan Prost how difficult it is to deal with somebody like this. People knowing me, they know that if I, if I put my word on the table, I would never do anything uh, strange or incorrect. There's absolutely no way. And then we had the, the start. I uh, started first, and the second start where I started, started first. And I saw him on, on the left and with uh, plenty of space and said, OK, I take, take the normal line just to be to exit better. And then uh, he overtook me. And then we went to Pembre for testing. And uh, that's where we started the problem. They started to argue almost like two petulant children, really. I, I mean, I was looking at them thinking, you know, this, is, this behavior isn't befitting and I lost it a little bit and I ramped the pressure and they still didn't get it that you know effectively the team had to come first it, they just had to understand the team had to come first we gave them equality their behavior had to be consistent with the values of the team only one talk to I did not talk and uh, just just listening he said one what happened we had you had an agreement he said yes we had an agreement for the first start not for the second start Starting like this, said, mm, okay, that's a start of problem. But then, more, more important, he said, it's not me, it's Alain who overtook, overtook me. He said, Ayrton, there's 700 million of people, you know, they, they can watch the, the thing and... Uh, you know, in the end, I pushed so hard, I, uh, you know, I tipped them into, um, uh, you know, a very, very um, emotional, state uh, they were they didn't look like anything other than very frightened children at the time it took I don't know, maybe 20 minutes before he he has accepted that uh, and, he, and he started to to cry you know? i can't say that because now he's not there anymore but my mistake i went to a french journalist a friend of mine and he, he he has he had heard look, few things said I told him the, the story but I said please don't tell anything you know as at the time at this time we could uh, still be a little bit off sometimes and he has written that in the newspaper and uh, and Ayrton from this day was so upset that he, he saw somebody told him that it was in newspaper that he never wanted to talk anymore but that was only because of this of this reason I don't want to know anything about that French Guy, he has called me things in the press that uh, I don't deserve it, and uh, he should call them in my face, but he doesn't, he calls them in the press. You know, the, he was, yes, very, uh, no, it was, it was very difficult. I think the consequences were, again, they, they reached for their, uh, their nation, respective national press. It fueled it. I mean, it was smouldering after the race, but I had it in control, and then it got really fueled. And so, in the worst of atmospheres, the 1989 season continued. Two weeks after Imola, Senna was at his brilliant best on the streets of Monaco and followed it up with victory in Mexico. But back came Prost, and by the time he won the Italian Grand Prix at Monza, with Senna crashing out to the delight of the Tifosi, Prost had already announced he was no longer committed to McLaren and would be a Ferrari driver in 1990. In the next race at Estoril, Senna's controversial collision with the already black flag Nigel Mansell produced a non-finish and a body blow to his title hopes. At Suzuka, the penultimate race of the season, Senna had to win to keep his hopes alive. Prost, 16 points ahead, said he would not be opening the door if his teammate came to overtake. 
Has he got something up his sleeve? Or will he try? It looks to me as if he has no obvious answer. Will he try something desperate? He's shown himself capable of doing that. Out of the 26 who started, and if Cross comes up to any of them, this is the opportunity that Senna's looking for, and he's going through. Out! Oh, my goodness, this is fantastic. They meet. This is what we were fearing might happen during the race. And that means to say that Prost has won the World Championship. Alain Prost, World Champion of 1989. I remember being sitting in the lunch at the airport the next day and I said to Alain, you did the two biggest mistakes of your life. I said, why is it? Well, first of all, why did you go off the car? When, you know, they both shunted and uh, if they push both, Ayrton have to come and change the nose because the nose was destroyed, but your car was perfect. You know? Oh no, it was a big bang. When I, it was a big bang and the right wheel was like that. Yes, but the left wheel was also like that. <laughs> 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 he just uh, he laughed, yeah. but in fact, the car, his car had nothing. You know, he could uh, stay in the car, push. They push both the, the drivers. They do the same thing. They probably didn't penalize anyone. But instead, it was war with the FIA. How much contact did you have with Ayrton during the close season then, and how busy did it become? Well, quite a lot, because, you know, for everything that was said, and there was fines flowing to Ayrton, and he refused to come back, and he was going to drive in Indianapolis, and all these stories came up. So we were... Well, Ronnie must have been talking to him almost daily. 1990, Prost at Ferrari, Senna at McLaren, now enjoying the company of a relaxed and supportive teammate in Gerhard Berger. For Senna, his victory at Monza with Prost second was his sixth of the season and brought him back to Suzuka with the championship advantage over his former teammate. Now a non-finish for Prost would make Senna champion and after the events of the previous season, the Brazilian was determined to finish it in ruthless fashion. The grid is clear, the lights go, and Senna sprints away, but Alain Prost takes the lead. It's happened. Alain Prost has taken the advantage. Senna is trying to go through on the inside, and it's happened immediately. This is amazing. Senna goes off at the first corner, but what has happened to Prost? He has gone off too. Well, that is amazing, but I fear absolutely predictable. Yes, and that makes Ayrton Senna world champion this year. So Ayrton Senna uh, now with Prost not finishing the race quite clearly. He's out of his car, stuck in the gravel pit. That, I'm afraid to say, is the end of this year's Drivers' World Championship in favour of Ayrton Senna. There's Prost running back, but uh, it's all over for him. Well, that was predictable, I'm afraid. The man who got to the first corner first was going to be the world champion. I watched here, I watched uh, on the um, television cameras, they were obviously seeing Ayrton was walking back and I was, I was furious because for many reasons, uh, A, obviously it was a race win, it was a race we could have won, B, um, it was inconsistent with the principles by which I think one goes motor racing. I knew beforehand the start would be diff very difficult for me because I was on the, uh, not on the right side on the circuit, on the dirty side of the asphalt. And I already expect the Ferrari to jump slightly ahead of me. And it all happened exactly as I predict. And then I just follow the car in front of me, that move in front of me. And as we approach for the first corner, I was right with him. He opened a gap. When he opens the gap, I went for it, and then he decided to go back again to the corner, and then it was impossible to avoid the contact. How bad was that in terms of things you've seen in Formula One? That was pretty bad, and I, I was very upset inside me. I thought, bloody hell, he could have done it without doing that. Why did he have to do it? And I remember they had their accident, and they both walked. They didn't even look to each other. They walked to the pit, and as Ayrton walked, he came in the garage, we were all looking at the television. And he turned around and he said to me, they're not going to stop the race. And I said, no, I don't think so. But inside me, I was wanted to stop the race. He had this look on his face. 
you could say resignation, you could say lots of things, but whatever it was, he, when ultimately I came into contact, I just said, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed in you. Did your respect for him diminish at that time or? Yes, yes, I think I saw him with different eyes. He deliberately took Prost off in 1990, but all denied it and nothing was done. Everybody, people all knew, but nobody said anything. And anyway, 91, I got elected just before the Japanese Grand Prix. And I'd just been in the office a fortnight, so I was politically sort of quite weak. And Bales, remember, was still president of the FIA. I was only president of the sport. And <laughs> Senna, in the post-race press conference, said, completely said that he'd taken Prost off. He'd done it. He meant to do it. And Ron Dennis, of course, immediately realised that uh, this could be very serious because it's a sort of hanging offence to do that. They could have taken his licence away. So he had a word with Senna saying, you've got to sort of withdraw, apologise and so on. And uh, Ayrton wouldn't. Absolutely. He said, I was telling the truth and I always tell the truth. So anyway, Ron said to me, will you have a word with him? So I got Senna up to the room. And I said, Ayrton, look, there are two kinds of people in sport. There are amateurs and professionals. The amateur does something because he feels like it. The professional does something because it's in his interest as a sportsman. What you did was amateur. And he sat and he thought, and then his eyes started to well up. And he said, you're right. Yeah, you're right. He's very intelligent, so He said, you're right, but he said that took that race away from me and, and, and I've been doing this since I was six years old and I've never done anything else and it's my life and he took that race away. So we had all of that. Anyway, in the end, but with Senna together, we sort of composed some weasel words for us, an apology that was not enough for him to feel he'd apologised but on, enough to make it very difficult for Bales to attack him. And that was that. But it was an extraordinary thing because you, you, you I realised then sort of just how sort of passionate he felt about the whole thing. It's just extraordinary. And of course he was an amazing talent. 1991, the controversy had subsided, the opposition from Alain Prost and Ferrari had faded and Ayrton Senna was world champion once again. And in his remaining years with McLaren there were plenty of opportunities to see a Formula One legend at his brilliant best. Perhaps his most famous drive, the opening action in the European Grand Prix at Donington in 1993. Cross gets away well, so does Hill, so does Schumacher. Senna is crowded out and is down to fifth position. And Ayrton Senna is up to fourth position ahead of Schumacher and challenging Wendlinger as they go round the right-hander into the old hairpin. Senna is up to third. And Senna goes through into the lead. He's passed Alain Prost, so the McLaren leads, Prost second, Hill is third. I think that the best two laps of any Grand Prix in, in the history of the sport. I went down in the cockpit and he just grabbed my arm and he said, oh, I feel very very strange to do this on a McLaren for the last time. And I said, well, you feel strange. Well, how you feel? We feel, and we don't want you to go, you know, you're going on your own. And, and then I said, I don't need to tell you how important this race is for us, but if you win it, I love you forever. And then I, I saw his eyes, they were kind of wat watering, you know, he got very emotional. But he was an emotional guy, I would say, good Latin. Uh, but it didn't affect him, you know, so. I, I, it affected me more. I said, oh, bloody hell, I'm, I'm getting him emotional just before the start of the race. Yes. But uh, start, won the race, and we become the most successful Grand Prix team. And, and, and then we had a party, fantastic. And uh, after the race, it was the Tina Turner concert, yeah, and he yeah. pulled him into the stage and sing um, um, Simply the Best. Simply the Best. 1993, Williams dominated Formula One, giving the world title first to Mansell and then a returning Alain Prost. For 1994, though, Senna would join Damon Hill at the championship favourites. Prost quit the sport rather than have Senna as a teammate again, but the Williams team had the driver they wanted and Senna had the drive that he'd been chasing for a long, long time. By 92, Ayrton had sort of rather decided that McLaren were not going to be able to
provide him a competitive car. And Ayrton was ringing Frank the whole time saying, I want to drive your car, I want to drive your car. I was in Hungary with Dad. It was over the years he's taken me, when I was starting in 14, 15, he would take me to one extra race in addition to Silverstone. So I would always choose Hungary. And I was there when Nigel won the 1992 World Championship. But I remember walking into Dad's hotel room about 9.30 at night to say goodnight to Dad and you know, into connecting doors, walking in in my pyjamas and to say goodnight, thinking just Dad would be in the room. And there's Ayrton Senna kind of standing there having a conversation with him. And I was mortified, as he would be as a 14-year-old girl. And your hero, who had a massive crush on, is there. And there I am in my, you know, floral pyjamas. <laughs> well, we got on famously when he first started. And um, obviously he knew I was a big fan and he appreciated that. And then we were given the opportunity of his driving for us. But he was all in all a remarkable individual. And uh, I've been quoted before, and Irene, if I'm quite happy to repeat the quote, he certainly was on the way to becoming a president of Brazil. I think he had politics in mind. I think, and I think if he had done so, he'd have probably walked it. We knew what he could do. Um, and uh, we were learning him, he was learning us, and he was a, a quiet guy. So um, we had to find out what he wanted, and he, he told us what he wanted with the car. But he was quite, a, I say, a quiet guy. So I was working along with Julian Jacobi, his manager, trying to get into him and get him what he needed, and just make him comfortable in the team. And it was starting to come together, to be honest. We were on a one-to-one -one thing, whereas at the start of the year we didn't quite know what the communication channels were. So you know, it was all starting to come together, to be honest. And he was more relaxed with the team than he was at the start. But things started badly for Senna. His first Williams Grand Prix, his home race in Brazil, and an unforced error puts him out. That is Senna. Senna. My goodness, Ayrton Senna frantically gesticulating, and that's blown the race for him if Michael Schumacher can just keep going. Michael Schumacher at Benetton was the new challenger to Senna's prestige, and while he was making a flying start to the season, Senna left the second race in Japan still looking for his first points. And it is go. Yellow flags waving in the background and, and straight into the lead goes Schumacher. Olivier Panis has stopped and a spinner there. That is Senna. Senna and he's rammed. Rammed by Larini. Ayrton Senna is out of the Pacific Grand Prix. The man who has yet to score points because he failed to finish in Brazil. One thing I do remember is that when he, uh, he spun chasing Schumacher in Brazil, uh, about 10 laps from the end, I think, and, and uh, he came back in the garage and we said, you know, what happened on the car? He said, nothing, I just made a mistake and I'm sorry it won't happen again. And we also looked at each other and, you know, OK, fair enough, we know that won't happen again. So I think, um, you know, I think the car wasn't quite where he thought it would be and it wasn't quite where we thought it would be, but um, I think we got to the bottom of it. Unfortunately, it was a bit late when we did. We have some problems, but I think we have a good car and I think we have a good engine too. We just have to work on these problems at this moment, which the team is doing. And for that, we have some modifications here at the Imola, which we shall be trying the next two days, hoping to improve part of the, the difficulties we have found so far. So we went to Imola with, I remember the front page of the Autosport, it said Schumacher 20, Senna 0. And Ayrton was the sort of, it was a very, very tense environment. We are here in this third round, European season, starting now, starting from zero. So basically our championship starts here, 14 races, not 16. Imola, 1994, the fatal accident of Roland Ratzenberger on the Saturday and the crash that claimed the life of Ayrton Senna on the Sunday. 20 years on, everyone remembers the mood and detail and implications of that tragic weekend. I remember well, we walked together to the, to the uh, briefing in the morning on Sunday, and Ayrton says to me, Gerd, uh, next week or two weeks, we should all sit together about safety. We should talk about safety. There's a couple of ideas I have we would like to talk with him. During the safety car period, seven laps, there was no, apart from us saying to Ayrton, keep over on the right-hand side on the grid, uh, there was no exchange, although quite certain the radio was working, he didn't say anything to us. And we didn't say anything else to him. We liked each other, really. 
And I remember in the starting grid, I was behind with the Ferrari and he was sitting in the car already and I was just walking back. And of course, Ferrari driver in Imola, uh, me was very special there. So the, I, I got all the fans jumping in the, in up and down and, 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 and waving to me. And Erdogan was looking to me and uh, was loving and was doing like this, like, and you could see, we've been friends. He was happy for me. And that's the last thing I remember him. And that's how I like to remember him. It was an enormous shock for all of us. And the worldwide grief at this tragedy uh, had absolutely no precedent. For Frank, it was you know, an amazing day when he finally signed it. And, and, and I think to this day, he will continue to regret um, that it was cut so, so short his time with us. I think he would take, take it to the limit. Of course, he would uh, uh, be afraid of hurt, getting hurt or, or dying, but not to the point where you would deter him from exploring the limits. He had this incredibly personality, electricity around here. I mean, you could be in the paddock and, and then Ayrton said, wow, Ayrton Senna. He had this thing, you know, you either have it or you don't. Senna wins at Monaco for the fifth time. Without Ayrton, it would have been maybe two, three, four, five more championships. <laughs> it's possible. Got to remember him as a great racing driver and a quite incredible personality. If my life would have been different, yes, maybe a little bit, but at the time, not now. He was one of those guys that he have an aura, whatever he... If he comes up into a room, that room change. I feel happier now, like I could have been if I was only a racing driver winning one or two cha more championships. I definitely think in, in Ayrton's case that he totally put his faith in God and whatever would be, would be God's will, and he just got on with his job. I had a tremendous time, you know, the records tell, speak for themselves, the results, the championships. The most important thing to all of us is to keep the good moments and, and, and uh, keep uh, the happiness that we had together.